While exploring the world's most expensive foods, we spilled the tea on some of the priciest beverages money can buy. From camel's milk, to authentic French champagne, and 30 year aged Scotch whiskey. These are some of the most expensive liquids you can drink. Our first stop is Uji, Japan, where a sixth generation tea farmer produces some of the world's highest grade matcha. After these leaves are plucked, dried, and ground, they will turn into the finest matcha. But not all matcha is the same. The greener matcha is, the smoother and more complex its flavor. High quality jade green matcha can cost 20 times as much as pale green matcha. And while this bright green powder takes a few seconds to dissolve in water, it takes an entire year to grow the plant it comes from. So what makes ceremonial grade matcha so exceptional? And why is it so expensive? Matcha at its highest quality is referred to as ceremonial grade because of the central role it plays in Japanese tea ceremonies. Lower quality matcha, also called culinary grade matcha, can be made sweet with sugar and cream in desserts, but in its tea form, it's very bitter. Matcha is a flavor. Jintaro is a sixth generation matcha producer. He runs a 180 year old tea farm, one of the oldest in Uji, Japan, a city with a centuries old tea history. In spring, they sprout young, tender leaves, and that's the sign that matcha season has begun. ま、to make matcha, he only needs the very first leaves of the plant. It's there that there's a higher concentration of nutrients, and they will make the best quality tea. At peak harvest, collecting leaves can take hours, but the reason why the plants are in the shade is not to protect those plucking them from the sun, but to protect the plants themselves. Extensive exposure to sunlight develops bitterness in the leaves. Blocking the sunlight preserves their flavor and gives them a bright green color. Before harvest in the spring, the plants spend 30 to 40 days in the shade. Jintaro uses rice straw panels to shade his plants, a method that's become extremely rare among tea farmers. Most farmers now use plastic nets. They're more convenient and can be reused. Jintaro's plants spend double the time in the shade of what is recommended to make matcha, which is 20 days. While plants that make lower grades of matcha are harvested two or three times a year, ceremonial grade matcha is made from plants that have been plucked only once. After an entire day of picking, Jintaro's work is just getting started. <laughs> できるだけフレッシュな状態で蒸して乾燥させるために、えっと、そうですね、早い、その日中には絶対やりたいなというところです。昨日作業終わったのは、えっとそうですね、えっと、本当に11時半から12時ぐらいで、キロに着いたのは
どういう蒸しをしたらいいのかどういう乾燥をしたらいいのか、えー、とやっぱり最初の方の日にちのもの例えばもう今日なんていうのは本当にちょっと一番気を使うところではあります。The first step of processing of the leaves is steaming. Steaming locks in the flavor and preserves their bright green color. But most of all, it prevents oxidation, which would turn them into black tea. The first step of processing of the leaves is steaming. Steaming locks in the flavor and preserves their bright green color. But most of all, it prevents oxidation, which would turn them into black tea. The first step of processing of the leaves is steaming. Steaming locks in the flavor and preserves their bright green color. But most of all, it prevents oxidation, which would turn them into black tea. After steaming, the leaves go into this leaf spreader, a series of four mesh tubes. Where they're rapidly cooled by the wind. This eliminates the water on the leaves and prepares them for the next step drying. The tea leaves at Jintaro's farm are dried using a 97 year old furnace, which gives them a unique roasted aroma. After drying, the stems are removed. And the leaves are sorted. Leaves up until this point are called tincture, and they will only become matcha after they're turned into a green powder. But before doing that, Jintaro usually tastes the unrefined leaves. He's very critical of his work. いい感じ。うん、蒸しは通ってますね。毎回します。やっぱりどういうものができたかっていうのが湯に浸すとすごく香りとかも分かりやすいので結局乾物の状態でもある程度の香りは分かるんですけど湯に浸した方が浸した方がすごく分かりやすいでお抹茶になった時にどういうふうになるかなっていう想像ができやすいですねまあまあまあまあ具体的に言うと,、えー、と色はうちのものにしてはすごくいいなと思ってますあとは味もまあ、苦みは全然なくてそれはすごくいいんですけどうまみもなくはないただやっぱりなんというかいつもそうなんですけど結局理想はすごく高くて<笑>毎年まあまあって言ってると思いますよくあの諸先輩方にも共通して同じ気持ちだなって思うのは本当に一生のうちに満足できるお茶ができるのなんて1回か2回ぐらいと。Ceremonial grade matcha is ground using a stone mill. It's designed to grind counterclockwise only. This traditional method grinds a fine powder that preserves the nutrients of the leaf, but it's very slow. It takes Jintaro an entire hour to grind just 40 grams of matcha. With an automated crusher, this would happen in seconds. The matcha stone mills are some of the most traditional instruments in Japan. They're made of granite and are entirely hand carved. Just one of these stone mills can cost over $1,300. It grinds the matcha into a fine, glossy powder. But once matcha is ground, the fragrance slowly disappears and becomes more delicate. So Jintaro usually grinds it one more time before selling it. うまみ、朝日独特の香りとあとはまあ東園ならではの最高、えー、日本最高の天茶乾燥炉ならではの少し、あのー、日を感じるというか香ばしいような香りが入っているのが特徴的かなと思いますね。セレモニアルグレードマッチャー contains a higher level of an antioxidant called catechin and more chlorophyll than other green teas. This is as a result of the shading process and the slow grinding. While the Japanese public has long been familiar with the distinction between ceremonial grade and culinary grade matcha, it's relatively new to the rest of the world. But matcha's popularity has been soaring. In 2020, the global matcha market was worth $3 billion, and it's expected to exceed $5.5 billion by 2027. In the last 10 years, exports of matcha from Japan have doubled. Compared to 30 years ago, they've quadrupled. But these numbers barely refer to ceremonial grade matcha. The lower costs of production, faster turnaround, and the ability to harvest leaves up to three times a year have made culinary grade matcha a more popular choice for farmers. In Uji, only 60 families are left growing ceremonial grade matcha. For Jintaro, taking over the family business wasn't an obvious choice. 
考えたことがなかったのでもうやりたくないんだよねとか言ってるとなんかそんな素晴らしいことって本当に世界的にも希少だよっていうこと。もう今では本当に仕事というよりも本当に半分なんというか趣味ではないですけどあの非常に好きでやっているっていうところがあるかなと思います。Once all this year's young leaves are picked and ground into matcha powder, Jintaro will spend the fall pruning the trees, plowing and fertilizing the soil. Come winter, he will weave the rice straw to shade his plants and new leaves will sprout again. Ready to be turned into matcha. 今18年お茶に携わってますけど理想のお茶っていうのは本当にできてないと思っていますしただ多分ずっとそうなのかなと思っているんですけど難しいんですけどまあ僕は本当にお茶が好きでやっているので次また頑張ろうっていうことにもなりますし楽しいところにもなりますね。Camel milk can cost you $30 per litre. Compare that to cow's milk, and it's almost 30 times the price. But for hundreds of years, camels have been used to produce milk, yogurt, and even cheese. So, why would anyone milk a camel? And what makes the milk so expensive? Camel milk may not be quite as popular as cow milk. Compared to the 600 million metric tons of cow milk produced worldwide, Only about 3 million tons of camel milk are produced each year. However, camel milk is an important staple across Africa and the Middle East, and some cultures rely on it. Somalia and Kenya alone produce 64% of the world's camel milk. Camelicious in Dubai has over 6,000 camels on its farm and produces 4 million litres of milk each year. And as you know, the people in the Middle East connected with the camels for transport and for food. And their、uh, main diet was camel milk and dates. So it's a long history. The demand for camel milk is increasing day by day, and we are facing now a challenge which to meet the demand because the supply is less than the demand. This demand has kept the price high. And camel milk's profile as a new health food has boosted sales. It's slightly lower in saturated fat, has 10 times the vitamin C, and has more calcium and potassium than cow's milk. These benefits have led many people to start using it as an alternative medicine, despite very limited evidence. Online celebrity endorsements have also led more and more people to try it. While new camel farms are appearing across the world, the popularity is still limited. And in Europe, there are still 12,000 cows for every single camel. But even if you do have a lot of camels, it's not exactly easy work to get the milk. Roughly, we are milking 1,300 camels、uh, twice a day. So it's a very intense work. Lots of people are included into the job. So when camels are arriving here, they go through a very strict quarantine procedure where we check them for different diseases. Whenever needed, we treat them and we start training them for the milking parlor. It's very crucial that, that we provide a very relaxed, very calm atmosphere for the, for the camels during milking to be able to release the milk. So we had to train the camel to be able to milk them without the calf. So that was a very intensive work. And every camel is different. So for some camels, the training itself to, for the milking parlor takes two, three days. But for, for some camels, it, it took weeks. Once this training period is over and your camels are producing milk, you still don't get anywhere near as much as you would from a cow. One cow can give around like 50 liters per day, while the camel milk can give six to seven liters. The cow in three years will give more than 50,000 liters, while in the camels, in three years, you will get maximum four to seven thousand liters. Unlike the dairy industry, where male calves are often killed and disposed of, Every camel must be kept near its young to continue producing milk, meaning that two animals will need to be kept fed and healthy to produce just seven liters of milk each day. Camel milk is costly. In addition to that, their feed cost. We are here at Camelicious giving our camels、uh, natural and fresh alfalfa, 
hay in addition to wheat bran only. We are not giving any concentrates or any uh, feed additives. So after all this work, what does the milk actually taste like? It smells like milk. Yeah, it does have it does have a different taste to it. It's a bit salty. I would say saltier than normal milk, but it's quite creamy. I I don't hate it. It's almost like salty. It would I would say it doesn't taste like regular milk. I would have it again. As this milk grows in popularity, and selective breeding leads to camels that produce more milk, the price may come down. But for now, camel milk remains an expensive luxury. Camel is a different species, so we didn't want and still don't want to turn them into a milking machine because we are thinking long term. So we would like to have a long production life here with these camels on this farm. Champagne is synonymous with wealth and luxury. It often costs double the price of other sparkling wines, such as Prosecco or Cava. A decent quality bottle of it can cost you anywhere from $50 to $300. And vintages can often sell for thousands. So what makes champagne so expensive? Champagne is often used as a generic term for sparkling wine. But in fact, champagne is only true champagne if it's made here, in Champagne. About 150 kilometers east of Paris, this highly protected region of France is home to the world's most prestigious and expensive champagne cellars and cellars, such as Moet and Chandon and Perrier Jouet. All other sparkling wines made outside of this region, even those from neighboring parts of France, must be labeled differently. Which means in this relatively small area, a little over twice the size of San Francisco, the world's entire stock of true champagne is made. That's over 300 million bottles every year, with an annual revenue of over $5 billion. Champagne sales have grown steadily since the 1950s, but its future growth depends on the protection of the region's unique climate. Northern France's variable conditions are the first factor for elevated prices. With an average temperature of 50 degrees Fahrenheit, this location is cooler than France's other wine-growing regions which gives the grapes the right acidity for sparkling wine production. However, an often freezing continental weather front makes the winemaking process more difficult than other dependable ecosystems. La particularité du, du champagne, c'est d'abord sa situation géographique et les, les conditions climatiques. Et ensuite, évidemment, c'est un processus d'élaboration qui a été, euh, qui a été euh, peaufiné, qui a été amélioré au fil des, du temps, au fil des, des siècles maintenant, puisqu'on parle de plus de deux siècles. On cueille des raisins, évidemment, à parfaite maturité. Ça, c'est déjà un critère très, très important. Et ensuite, eh bien, le processus de fermentation alcoolique va nous donner un, un vin blanc, ou plusieurs, ou une, une variété de vins blancs. During harvest, 120,000 workers descend on Champagne to pick grapes from 84,000 acres of vines. It's harvested by hand uh, because the, the machine uh, is forbidden by law. And uh, it's important to select only the best grapes, uh, especially because of the heterogeneity of uh, each different plots and each different vines. For me, it's a really a good sign and important sign of quality. To be on the hill, it's a really good thing for the exposition. The sun is always uh, going on the vines all the day. When it's raining, the water never stops. It's going on the bottom. This is where, historically, we have the best structure of the soil. Champagne, it's clay and chalk. This is really the best uh, quality in terms of soil. Authentic Champagne is produced via the Méthode Champenoise where the wine undergoes a primary fermentation in oak or stainless steel vats and a secondary fermentation inside the bottle. This method is controlled and restricted within the European Union, so that wines from outside the Champagne region cannot be described as Champagne. 
However, wines from all over the world are produced in exactly the same way, and instead are labelled as sparkling wine, produced via the Méthode Traditionnelle. Some winemakers in countries outside of the EU ignore European labelling laws altogether and continue to produce sparkling wine bearing the Champagne name. These imitations are constantly challenged by the Comité Champagne, which works with more than 80 lawyers worldwide to protect the authentic Champagne brand. Ultimately, despite similarities in production and possibly taste, only true Champagne comes with the history and prestige of the region. Champagne production dates back to the 3rd century, when the Romans first planted vineyards in northeastern France. During the mid-17th century, with the development of bottled fermentation, Champagne officially became a sacred drink, when it was served at the king's courts during the accession of Louis XIV. However, the carbon dioxide gas, which built up inside these early bottles, often caused them to explode in the cellars. Therefore, great efforts went into ridding the wine of its bubbles. But, by the 19th century, the sparkling version of Champagne had grown in popularity, especially among the rich and royalty, as the large Champagne houses optimised mass production of sparkling Champagne with the development of thicker glass and corks, the modern Champagne industry began to form. Amazingly, despite the region becoming a key battlefield during both World War I and World War II, some Champagne production still continued. It's estimated that by the end of the Great War, about 40% of Champagne's vineyards had been destroyed. Because of the cutback in production, bottles made during either war fetch a high price. In 2015, Sotheby's auctioned a Krug cellar visit and a tasting of their wartime 1915 vintage for $116,000. Champagne's affiliation with luxury, wealth and celebrity has kept prices high. From crowning kings, <laughs> to launching great ships. Even Jay-Z has gotten in on the action. In 2014, he became part owner of Armand de Brignac, also known as Ace of Spades, a champagne brand run by the Cartier family. In September 2019, they released their rarest, priciest cuvee yet, comprised of three vintages from 2009, 2010, and 2012. The wine was left to age for six years until the bottles, only 3,535 of them were made available for a cool $1,000 per bottle. But what about the future? Champagne became the world's first wine-growing region to examine its carbon footprint and implement a carbon plan, as a result of worrying statistics. Global warming has seen temperatures in the region rise by 1.2 degrees Celsius over the last 30 years, and the grape harvest dates have moved forward by a fortnight. As Champagne's perfect climatic conditions are changing and the Paris Accord climate targets fail to keep up with global warming, the future of winemaking in this historic region could be in jeopardy. This whiskey costs $30,000. It's a single malt. Single malt whiskey is one of the most revered spirits in the world. It's exclusively made from barley, which is quite a cheap product. So how does one bottle get to be so expensive? Over the past 50 years, single malts have become increasingly popular. Scottish single malt exports grew by 14.2% in 2017 to just over $1.5 billion. One of the main players in the single malt market is Glenfiddich, whose parent company achieved a £1.2 billion turnover last year. Selling 1.2 million um, nine litre cases of, of uh, Glenfiddich around the world, we have 180 markets around the world that we gen generally service. In 1963, we started to commercially sell single malt, but also to promote it actively outside of Scotland for the what we give the single malt category the biggest push it's ever had in its life. We were fortunate enough to try a 12-year-old bottle worth $36 and a 50-year-old vintage worth $30,000. Nice, sweet, soft. The 12-year-old whiskey was certainly sweet and pleasant to drink 
but I was expecting the more expensive bottle to taste out of this world to justify its price. Oh, wow. Really distinct. You can taste much more European oak in this one. Mm. The, the distinction between the flavours, like if it's a lot smoother, a lot oakier. There seems to be truth that the longer the alcohol is in there, the smoother it tastes, so the more deserving of the expensive price. But that can't be the only thing that justifies one bottle being close to $29,000 more than another. Another reason is that making single malt is an extremely difficult process to get right. Barley is ground down and added to spring water. Heated to 64 degrees Celsius, it turns to sugar, dissolving into a fine, sweet, tangy liquid called wort. The wort is drained, cooled and passed into wash bags. This is heated and condensed in copper wash stills for its first distillation, and a second time in spirit stills. The spirit trickles into the spirit safe, ready for maturation, and then is batched in casks with spring water. Casks spend years in the warehouse, maturing into a single malt. So the secret to the quality of single malt is consistency. You've got to nail down your, your production so that your new make spirit comes off exactly the same. And, and we have a spirit quality team that are actively looking at and we also know the new make spirit on site as well. But there's more. An age 30 maturation can have 30 to 40% of the alcohol evaporated in the barrel, or 1% each year of the whiskey's life. This is because of something called angel share, the natural evaporation of the liquid into the atmosphere over time. So older whiskies are expensive, not just because they're old, but because there's less of them left. There's one more factor we haven't touched upon yet, status. It's, it's all about the equity of the brand, and the perception of the consumer about how much they're prepared to pay for our brands. I think in general, younger people want quality. They want good shoes, good clothes, nice cars, nice houses, and they want to be drinking single malt. And it's not just store-bought bottles. One factor that's driving up the price of single malts is a booming collector's market. A bottle of the Macallan 1926 60-year-old recently sold for $1.5 million in auction, marking the largest single sale ever for a bottle. Christie's International Director of Wine, Tim Tiptree, oversaw the sale. So it was one of 40 bottles produced from uh, a single cask that was uh, distilled in 1926 and then bottled in 1986 was a hand-painted bottle. So, uh, so I think it does um, add a little to the desirability, but um, it's the intrinsic quality of the whisky inside the bottle that um, is driving the demand. But Scotch has some serious competitors. Alongside China, India, Taiwan, Ireland, Japan is one of the world's major producers of unblended whiskies. For relaxing times, make it Suntory time. You might have heard of Suntory time. Suntory owned the Yamazaki distillery in Osaka prefecture. The rarity of their produce drove prices sky high. And the Japanese have come to the fore about four or five years ago, one of their whiskies, a Yamazaki, was made the um, best whisky in the world. And that created a lot of noise around the Yamazaki and single malt. But Yamazaki is owned by Suntory, and the bulk of what they produce goes to blends. So they had insufficient whiskey in their warehouses to actually continue on the success of what Yamazaki achieved in that one year. What dictates the price, the value of a whiskey sometimes, is the exclusivity. So the less there was, it, it drove the price up to the point where Yamazaki was being sold off at three, four times the, the normal value. But blended whiskies can also reach quite a high price. Will they ever be as expensive as single malt? We don't predominantly sell uh, much blended whiskies in, in our um, auctions. Single malts are much more rare, they're much more individualistic, so uh, whereas blended whiskies is, is typically sort of generally more um, produced in larger volumes and also is more uh, homogenous in, in the actual style and, uh, and taste profile. Thank you.